Hello, everyone. My name is Lindsay Doherty. I'm an assistant director for corporate education and global partnerships at UC Irvine's Division of Continuing Education. Thank you all for joining us for the second session in our Let's Learn Homeschooling series in partnership with Excelligence Learning Corporation. Today's lecture is called How to Teach Social Emotional Learning at Home. Thank you all for joining us. As you might have heard, this session is being recorded. The recording will be available within one to two business days on our website at ce.uci.edu. You can visit our free events page and click on the On Demand tab to view the recording. This series will be found under the Education tab. We will begin with a quick overview of Zoom and how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I'll tell you a little bit about UCI and the resources that we provide. I'll then turn it over to our guest presenter. At the end of this presentation, we will have a short Q&A to address some of the questions that were submitted during the presentation. If you look at the top or bottom of your screen, you will see a menu bar with a few icons. You'll click on the chat bubble icon and the chat window will show up. You can also use the Q&A button to submit questions as well. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar, please send a chat message over to all panelists and we will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for our presenter regarding the content, please submit it within the chat window to all panelists and we will address it at the end. Here at DCE, we serve the lifelong learning and career development needs of individuals, organizations, and the community on a local, regional, and global scale. Today, we offer over 90 industry-relevant certificate programs, short courses through our learning consortium, free events like these, and more. Our programs and courses cover a variety of topic areas, and our corporate team can provide customized learning experiences for groups or organizations. I also want to mention our Division of Career Pathways. They serve as the hub for career development and preparation for our students, staff, faculty, alumni, and professionals, as well as a recruitment center for local and national organizations. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining us. It is my pleasure to introduce Nicole Morelli, a product developer and content manager at Really Good Stuff and former teacher of grades one through three. She specializes in product development for STEM and social emotional learning. Thank you for being here today. Take it away, Nicole. Hi, thank you everyone for having me. Um, I just wanna to talk to you a little bit about our um, Excelligence Learning Corporation to start and then we'll dive into um, the program. So Excelligence Learning Corporation is the world's leading tech-enabled platform company in early childhood and elementary education. Educators, parents, and children in more than 40 countries use our over 20,000 innovative, high quality, and grade appropriate educational products and teaching solutions to teach, learn, and grow. Excelligence's diversified portfolio of leading businesses and brands delivers quality, innovation, service, and value on a global scale by leveraging cutting edge technology, early brain research science, digital first product, and go to market development in the state of the art fulfillment. It includes top rated companies such as Discount School Supply, serving the birth through K age children and families, really good stuff serving pre-K through sixth grade, students and families, and Steve Spangler Science serving students and families of all ages. And a little bit about really good stuff. Really good stuff has been serving the education community for over 25 years with quality, innovative, and award-winning teacher-created products. Really good stuff prides itself on the fact that our products are developed by teachers. We feel that teachers bring the experience and passion needed to create products that are ideal in the classroom as well as the home. We work hard and have fun creating products that help the teachers teach and the children be successful learners. So before we get started, I just want to tell you what the agenda will be. So we're gonna start with some social emotional learning overview topics. So um, what social emotional learning is, why you should use it, how to use it. Um, and then I'm going to give you a bunch of different tools that you can integrate at home. So as I do so, you're going to choose which ones are best for you. You're not going to take all of them and bring them into your home, rather just decide you know, what's best for my child. And as I'm doing those, I'm actually going to do some of the exercises with you so that it's easier for you then to do them with your child or your children. Finally, at the end of the program, we're going to um, give you some free resources and then we'll have our Q&A. So let's get started just talking about what social emotional learning is. So it's actually the way that people develop important skills such as self-awareness, self-control, social skills, um, and creating and maintaining relationships with others. So super important for our children to gain these skills at a young age. Um, and they also can be used inside and outside of the classroom and across all aspects of life. 
There are a ton of benefits to incorporating social emotional learning in your daily schedule, both at school and at home. Um, there are a ton of studies that prove that it improves test scores as well as behaviors. So even if you have a child that is um, that has great behavior, they can they can then move on to the next level of you know learning about kindness and character and just becoming even better people. So beyond the actual um, the actual tests and um, grades and things like that. Some other improvements that I've seen in my experience is children become more self-aware, they build self-esteem, um, they come up with coping skills that work best for them, and finally they are able to develop better connections with students and adults. So how can you incorporate this into your daily schedule at home? So there's a few things that you should do. You, sh you should decide, well, when am I going to do this? You need to set a time during the day that you're going to incorporate some kind of SEL practice um, because it's easily forgotten if you don't make it part of your schedule. One part of the day that um, I always did it with my class is the morning meeting. So before your school day starts, um, a morning meeting is basically to set the stage for the day. So talk about what you're gonna do that day, ask each other questions. Um, it's really like a nice, you know, comforting time for your child to kind of feel comfortable talking to you and getting ready for the day. So you could do that right before they start um, their schoolwork. And finally, at the end of the session, I'm going to tell you about ways you can incorporate SEL into your reading, writing, and math. So if you're having a hard time fitting it into the schedule, you can easily add it into your academics. So right now, we're seeing that social emotional learning is trending. There's a lot of schools that are implementing SEL programs, um, and they actually benefit the children and the adults. So you'll see teachers are benefiting, paraprofessionals, pretty much everyone that's experiencing this is gaining um, some kind of skill or some kind of, you know, um, practices in their life. So teachers are becoming more self-aware, they're taking care of themselves more, um, and their relationships are getting better with their students. It's also really important that parents are involved because we want our children to know that all of these practices are not just for school. They're, they should be taking them throughout their day, throughout their lives, um, and as they get older, they're still relevant. So before I go, get started on our first topic, I would like to know more about your child and their school and um, what they do for SEL. So if you could just comment and answer this question, the question is, does your child's school incorporate social emotional learning in their daily schedule? If so, tell us about the practices they do. So you can tell us if they have a program, um, if they do yoga every morning, if they talk about character education, whatever you um, feel comfortable sharing um, is great. And we're gonna get started on a topic that should be the most familiar to you because this is probably what you learned as a child. It's very simple um, and it's called character education. So. It's basically teaching children to be good people using character traits as a guide. So teaching them about respect, fairness, friendliness, honesty, things like that. Um, this can so easily be taught, but sometimes it's forgotten because there's such a focus on academics in school. Okay, so as a parent, what you can do to help them with character education is to use the language often and to also be an example for them. So if you go to the store and you get the wrong change back, let your child know that you gave that change back um, to the cashier because you were being honest, okay? And I also wanted to tell you a little bit about my experience in social emotional learning, which I will bring up throughout the session probably often. Um, we had actually a mindfulness coach at my school that implemented a character education program in our entire school with a team of teachers. Um, and he also did things like yoga, mindfulness, things like that. So that was really where I got my experience um, and my passion for social emotional learning. So how to teach character ed at home. So what you can do with your child is first explicitly define the traits. So they need to know exactly what these words mean. And on the next slide, I'm going to provide you with a list of the words here um, under character focus words with a definition so that it's easier for you to do. Okay, so as you're explaining the definition, you should be giving your child some examples of each of these words as well as discussing scenarios. And um, like mentioned before, you need to make this part of your every day or your, you know, it should be part of your every day, but you can um, make a plan to, to talk about it weekly, monthly, daily, whatever's comfortable for you. And finally, positive reinforcement. So the more you point out what your child's doing, you're noticing that they're being kind, you're noticing that they're being compassionate. Um, point it out, the more they hear, you know, you praising them, the more they're going to be inclined to do it. So here are some um, free resources that you'll be able to use with your child. Here are 12 different um, character ed words with the definition 
um, just an easier way for you to get started. And then we also have our good character rules poster, which you can read with them daily, um, weekly, whatever you choose for your child. And finally, I, to me, this is the most um, important part because it really gets your child to reflect and think about how they feel about different things or what they're doing in their lives. Um, so reflective writing and drawing. This is another one that's easy to bring into your home. You could have them do it every morning, at the end of every school day, however you wanna do it. So for pre-K through first, um, you can do daily drawing, depending on where your child's at. If they're able to write, then you might take them into the writing um, level. You'll see there's a little bit of an overlap with the, the grade levels because it really depends on the child. Um, so if they're doing the drawing, all you do is take a few pieces of paper, fold them in half, staple them into a booklet, and have your child do some drawing. So tell me about how you were kind today. What did you do? Okay, draw a picture. Let's keep track of all these kind things you're doing. And then if they're a little older and, and they're able to write, you can have them do a couple different things. You could have them journal, they can create a log to keep track of what they're doing, um, or you can even give them writing prompts. So this here on the right is um, from one of our character education journals. And I just wanted to give you kind of an idea of what you can ask them to write about, um, some prompts, some questions, some drawings. So you'll see we have, why do you think it's important to be honest? Make a list of ways to show honesty. Name a way that you can be respectful at home. Draw a picture of yourself being respectful at home. So those, that's just to get you started. And then of course you can expand that um, and cover all of the character Edwards. So now I'm going to jump into something that's a little more challenging. It might be a little less familiar to you, um, but it's really great for children to get them to calm down um, and to be really in touch with their selves. So these three topics fall under health body, um, healthy mind, body, and soul practices. So we have yoga, mindfulness, and meditation. And as you probably already know, there are many mental and physical health benefits to all three of these, okay? And you can incorporate them whenever you want. You can do them before school, at the end of the day. Um, if you do brain breaks throughout the day and you wanna give your child you know, a break that's a little more calm, you can have them do it then. And before I jump into each of those individually, I actually want to share this fun fact with you. So in some schools, these practices are actually being used in place of detention and in school suspension. So that just shows the weight um, of what they do for children. So let's get started with yoga. So you've probably seen this before. This is traditional yoga, doing poses, holding the poses. Um, and then I wanna tell you a little bit about storytelling yoga, which is really fun. You can kind of incorporate um, ELA into your yoga session. So let's get started here with our traditional yoga. So here's a bunch of child-friendly yoga poses that your child can do. Um, and you can use this slide as a resource for them if you wanna, um, once this is sent out, you can open this slide and let them do their different poses. And then this is called storytelling yoga. So I just started a short little story with different poses they can do. So when you do this, you definitely wanna have them write out a longer story. Um, I just did a very simple beginning of a story um, just to give you an example. So here we go. The owl sat perched in her tree as she watched the animals go by. Soon, she saw a horse walking by. The horse stopped and stared at her, and then walked into the distance and began smelling a flower. So you can have your child either go through these different poses rather quickly, um, if they're kind of just getting started doing yoga, or if they're a little more advanced, you could have them, you know, read the first part of the story, have them do the owl pose for 60 seconds, have them then do the horse pose for, 50 se for um, 60 seconds, and so on. So your child might be more excited to do yoga if there's something um, more interactive than just doing the poses. So another mind, body, soul, um, well, two other uh, practices are mindfulness and meditation. Now you'll see in these examples that they, they sometimes overlap, um, but I just made some main bullets just so you can kind of understand the difference. So mindfulness is being aware of something in particular and being fully present. Where meditation is free, um, freeing yourself from external thoughts and focusing on what's happening in the moment. And in this one, you're really using your imagination. So I wanna do this practice with you, but um, what's really important is that you are basically acting as the child because if you put yourself in their shoes when you do this with them, it'll be easier for you to understand what they're experiencing. So you can do this with me right now, or if you wanna um, play this later when you feel more comfortable and you're in a, a better place for it, um, that's fine too. So this mindfulness activity is called breathe. 
close your eyes and begin to tune into the sound of your breathing. Pretend that you are holding a mug of hot chocolate. Take a deep breath and gently blow on your hot chocolate slowly to begin cooling it down. Take another deep breath. Hold it for five seconds. Again, gently and slowly blow into your mug of hot chocolate, cooling it down. Continue in this way with a deep inhale that you hold for a few seconds, followed by a slow, gentle exhale. When you are ready, open your eyes and breathe naturally. Okay, so that's our mindfulness um, example. And then we're going to do our meditation example, which is called Rainbow Cloud. Now this is a little bit longer, so I'm just going to take you through about half of it, just so you have the, an idea of what it's like. So when you do it with your child, obviously you're going to read through the entire thing. Assume your pose or position. So you can be sitting, standing, laying down, walking, whatever's comfortable for you, and you can have your eyes open or closed. Throughout this exercise, you will listen and visualize. Begin by taking a deep breath in and slowly and gently taking a deep breath out. Just relax. Now imagine a large fluffy cloud in front of you. As you look at this cloud, you notice something special. You do not see white, but you see a smooth rainbow of colors inside. This rainbow cloud is all that you can see. You can see its coolness, its smoothness, and its lightness. You can see all of its radiant colors. As you look deeper into the rainbow cloud, you see the color red glowing brighter than all of the other colors. Now imagine there is red surrounding you. Breathe in the color red. Feel the color red. Enjoy the color red. As you look deeper into the rainbow cloud, you see the color orange glowing brighter than all of the other colors. Now imagine there is orange surrounding you. Breathe in the color orange. Feel the color orange. Enjoy the color orange. Take one last look at the rainbow cloud and find your favorite color. Visualize yourself surrounded by your favorite color. And in your own time, come back. So you'll see I skipped the second half here um, of the colors, um, but then I just read the ending. So you'll take your child through all of these steps um, to help them meditate and really you know, let, let go and, and be in that moment with the rainbow cloud. So now we're going to switch gears over to um, positive thinking. So this is, a, this is a very simple, simple activity you can do with your child. Um, and it's around positive self-talk. So positive self-talk is exactly what it sounds like, talking positively about yourself. Um, and it's important because it's going to help build self-esteem um, in your child. So whether your child is in the elementary grades, middle school, high school, this works for pretty much everyone, even adults. Um, and what you do is you create I am statements, which are also known as positive affirmations. So an example would be, I am kind, I am helpful, I am safe. So you can come up with maybe three to five that you repeat every day with your child. And they should repeat them at least twice a day. So you can make it um, a morning routine and an afternoon routine um, or even an evening routine. The more they repeat these, these um, positive affirmations, the more they'll believe them. So spend some time you know, coming up with the right ones for them and repeating them. You'll also see here on the right, um, in the blue area, we have dots above each one. So you can actually tap the dots as you say um, the different positive affirmations. So it actually goes with the syllables. You'll see, you know, I am safe, I am strong, and so on. So having this kind of, you know, rhythm and beat kind of might help them enjoy it more and get used to it and remember what their positive affirmations are. And another topic under positive thinking is growth mindset. Growth mindset is very popular in schools. Um, and it's basically teaching your child that instead of having negative thoughts, they should have positive thoughts and, um, and should say them out loud. So instead of saying something like, I can never do this, or you know, I'm terrible at this, they can say things like, my mistakes help me improve. I won't give up until I'm proud. And I may not know the answer yet. So that last one there, is, it's called the power of yet. So anytime they have some kind of negative feeling about something, we wanna end it with yet because it will happen eventually. And they can use this for schoolwork, but they can also use it for different things like music, um, sports, cheerleading, any kind of um, skill they're practicing or learning. It's great to practice growth mindset. 
Okay, and this is another one. I think this is probably the most important for young kids to, um, to learn and to practice. And this is identifying and managing emotions. So the first thing you wanna do with your child is to talk about um, how to identify emotions. So when I feel angry, what does my face look like? What do I do? Um, when I feel sad, um, you know, tears come down my eyes, different things like that, like talking, exact, talking to them about exactly what's happening to their bodies is really important. And then go beyond what they, you know, their face. You might want to say something like, well, you know, when you feel angry, what happens with your body? Do, you, do your arms tighten up? Does your face get hot? Tell me about, you know, what happens to you. Um, and then once they're able to identify these different emotions and use um, this language, then you're going to teach them some, some um, coping strategies for when they're feeling the negative emotions. So if I'm feeling sad, what can I do to make myself feel better, to get back to a, a comfortable place? And we'll talk more about coping strategies later in the presentation. Um, this is another free resource we're going to give you around identifying and managing emotions. Um, this is a morning check-in. So at the end of the presentation, you'll get a link where you can print this out. And basically what you do is every morning, you have your child identify what feeling they're experiencing. So they might wake up feeling really tired. They might wake up feeling kind of angry about something. And this will just help you understand where they're at um, and might help you come up with ways to change the way they feel. Maybe they need to do some of their coping strategies um, to get back to where they need to be to start their schoolwork. Now this is another personal favorite of mine. However, you should be very cautious um, about if you, you know, if you decide to use this, this is made specifically for kids that are a little more emotionally advanced. So if your child's easily triggered, this is not the activity for them. But if you feel like your child is really advanced and they're able to, um, you know, feel negative emotions, but easily come back, this is an activity that um, will kind of push, push the limits a little bit and help them become even better at self-regulation. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about an experience I had as a teacher. So our mindfulness coach actually took us um, through this exercise as teachers. And it was, I think this is why it's really my favorite one. It's because um, I actually felt all these emotions that, you know, he was teaching us to do with our children. And I think the other teachers did too. So basically what you do is everyone gets one of these papers. So if you have two children, you can do it or have an adult and a child um, or more people. But basically you need one paper per person. And in the center, you need some kind of coloring utensil. So for the example I'm telling you about, we had colored pencils in the middle. Everyone had their paper with their mandala or mandala. Um, and you start coloring from the center out. So we had the lights dimmed. It was very quiet, very calm. And we started coloring the center um, of our mandala. And we slowly, you know, colored out to the next love layer. Um, and then the teacher told, or the mindfulness coach told us to stop for a second and to switch colors. So we put our color back into the cup and picked a new colored pencil. And at this time, we kind of felt like, you know, you start to feel a little stressed. Like I was, I was doing this a certain way because this is how I wanted it to look. But now I'm being told I have to change my plan. So it, it starts to get you a little bit anxious and a little frustrated. But then, you know, as time went on, he did that a few times. And then finally he said, okay, now I want you to switch colored pencils with the person to your, or I'm sorry, pass them to the right because we had a full of teachers. So we passed our pencil to the right and we started coloring with a color that we didn't choose. And that made us feel even more anxious and frustrated and um, out of control kind of. And then he went back to, you know, trading out the colored pencils over and over again. And then towards the end, he had us actually switch papers. So he said, okay, now I want everyone to pass their paper to the right. And as we did that, you could tell that even as adults, we were feeling really you know, we were losing control of what we were doing. It wasn't looking the way we wanted it to look. And it started to, you know, to bring on some emotion and made me feel a little frustrated and, you know, anxious. So the idea of this activity is, you're, you know, you're, you're getting yourself to a point where you're a little bit uncomfortable, but you're then able to self-regulate. So you're teaching yourself, okay, I'm frustrated, I'm upset, but how am I going to get myself back? And that's where, you know, you can teach your child, let's try your deep belly breathing. Can you get back to, um, to a comfortable place with your deep belly breathing. So as much as we don't wanna get our kids you know, upset or, um, or uncomfortable, this is really for our advanced children that, um, that are ready to take it to the next level. And now that we've talked so much about our children and their emotions and um, identifying those emotions, it's also important that they're able to identify emotions in other students. So you can do this a few different ways. You can use different um, storybooks, you can use photos, or talk about real life situations. But what you wanna teach them most is empathy, 
okay? Empathy is so important for young children to understand um, and to use. So for example, you might have them look at this picture of this little boy over here on the right. And you might say, you know, what kind of happened to him? What kind of scenario, you know, it looks like all the other kids are laughing. What do you think might have happened to him? How do you think he feels because of that? Um, and it's just an, a, a good way for them to kind of relate to um, how other children are feeling, how animals are feeling. Um, empathy though, it's just, I would say, you know, an, a really important skill for young children. And so now we talked about coping strategies a little bit before, um, but I wanna actually do a few with you. So these are different breathing strategies that you can do um, with your child. This first one here we have, this is a poster from Really Good Stuff, and one side is meant for younger kids, the other side is meant for older kids. So if your kid's able to read, you can have them look at the right side, um, and if not, then you might need to practice a few times going through the steps of the picture on the left side. So I'm gonna try this with you, and you might just have to kind of, you know, pretend right now that you're frustrated or upset, um, and I'll do it with you so that you're able to do it with your child. Okay, so how to calm your body. First, notice how you feel. Are you mad, upset, annoyed? Next, decide if you need to get away from what's upsetting you. After that, sit crisscross and put one hand on your heart and the other on your belly. Then take five slow, deep breaths with your eyes closed. Lastly, return quietly when your body feels calm and ready. So going through these steps um, over and over with your child will get them used to um, going to deep belly breathing as a calming strategy okay so you can use that if you feel it's right for your child here's another example of um, a coping strategy called mindful breathing for this one you can have your eyes opened or closed um, it's important that you're in a quiet space and you can repeat it as many times as you feel necessary this is called the balloon place your hands on top of your head and lace your fingers together inhale deeply as you raise your arms above your head as though you are inflating a balloon. Exhale slowly while you lower your arms. As you exhale, make a sound like a balloon losing all of its air. Okay, so that's a pretty quick one, but you can do it a few times, um, whatever works best for your child. And finally, um, this is a, another favorite of mine for coping strategies. This is called star breathing. And this is something else that I did, um, that my mindfulness coach actually taught us in school. So if you look at the dot on the star where it says start, I want you to find that dot with your eyes and just stare at it for a second. And we're going to do breathing as we travel around the star. So I want you just to breathe in slowly through your nose as your eyes follow the black line to the top point of the star. Go ahead and breathe in through your nose. And then once you're there, I want you to hold for a second and then you're going to blow out of your mouth like you're blowing into a straw, okay? So Breathe out as your eyes follow back into the inner point of the star. Then again, you're going to breathe in through your nose as your eyes follow to the outside of the star. Through your nose. And at that point, you're then going to breathe out of your mouth like you're breathing, pushing air through a straw. And you'll continue this around the star. So this is pretty, um, pretty simple, but it's really great for kids to have a visual as they're practicing their um, breathing. And you can do this as simple as drawing a star on a piece of paper, okay? And again, repeat as necessary, depending on what your child needs. They might be okay going, doing it once, doing it twice. They might need to do it a few more times. So you, you have to figure that out with your child. And here are some um, hands-on tools you can use in your home. So sensory tools are pretty popular right now. And um, some kids feel, sensory overload from different things like sights, smells, sounds, textures, tastes, movement, and so on. Um, and these children respond emotionally. So the more that they're touching and you know, hearing and doing all these sensory practices, the more they become self-aware of what kind of bothers them and they're able to then work on managing those feelings, okay? So I have some sensory tools that you can use that are for touch. Here are some ideas um, on, the, on the presentation. So in the pictures, we have orbs, then we have our Insta Snow and Magic Sand. Um, those are just some examples of what you could put in a sensory bin, but you also can use some items you have in your home. So you might have beads or sand. You even can use noodles, cooked or uncooked. And finally, uncooked rice is a really fun one to put in a bin. And let your kids kind of just explore, put their hands in it and mess around. And you can even make the uncooked rice one, you can put, um, 
plastic letters, plastic numbers, and make it um, a little more academic. They could search for different things. And we also then we'll talk, are gonna talk about calm down tools. So some calm down tools that your child can use at home when they're feeling a little worked up or stressed. Um, we have these calming jars here. So you can make your own calming jar at home, um, or you can see we have really good stuff calming jars. And you put different things inside of the jar and swirl it around and it helps the child um, it kind of distracts them from what's bothering them and will help them um, get calm. You also can use fidgets. So if you have, you know, fidget spinners, any kind of fidgets you have at home um, will work. You can use stress balls, tennis balls that they can squeeze, dough, which obviously they can um, manipulate as well. And finally, sensory textured balls are another um, good way for kids to, to calm down. And if you've never seen this before, this is a calm down corner. Um, these are becoming a little popular in schools. So, you know, you have your reading corner and you have other parts of your classroom. Some, some teachers are actually creating a calm down corner. Um, and you can easily do this at home too, okay? Because we want to recreate school at home to make your child feel um, comfortable and calm. So the last slide, I talked about a lot of calm down tools. You can incorporate all of them, any of them, in a calm down corner, as well as social emotional learning books, um, you can also do writing utensils or coloring utensils. Um, some kids like to journal, some kids like to draw pictures to get calm, um, whatever you feel is appropriate for your child. And finally, something that's related to emotions. So you can see here we have a puppy emotions gauge, that little um, bone thing there where they can find, um, you know, what emotion they feel. Or you can use the check-in sheet that we're going to give you the link to at the end of the presentation that I showed earlier. Um, the the um, morning check-in, if you remember that. And you can also keep that in your calm down corner daily. So if they need to, you know, go ahead and look at that and identify their feelings, that's a great tool to have too. Okay, so I wanna ask you another question to learn more about you and your child. Does your child like reading, writing, or math the most? And is there one that sticks out? And the reason I'm asking this is because I wanna teach you how to incorporate SEL into your reading, writing, and math lessons. Um, so in case you're struggling with the amount of time you have, um, or maybe your child doesn't really enjoy doing these different things, but they really love reading, you can then bring them into um, those lessons as well. So SEL and reading. There's a bunch of ways you can bring social emotional learning into your reading lessons. First of all, if you think about any book, um, any children's book, they probably already are covering an SEL topic. The characters probably persevering or being kind or doing something that's um, a good character trait. Um, so reading books and talking through them with your child is a great way to bring SEL into reading. You also can come up with scenarios um, related to the stories you're reading. So for example, if you heard a classmate being teased like the character in the story, how would you have handled it? And finally, um, acting out stories that have a lesson that's related to an SEL topic. So another free resource we're going to give you at the end is our Reader's Theater um, booklets, which look like this. So this is actually an example of one that you can print out. We have the Ugly Duckling. So you probably are familiar with the story. If you're not, feel free to print it out at the end of this and read through it. And at the end, you can ask your child different questions about the story. Okay, so this is a fun and interactive way for you to Number one, read the story together because there's different parts. But then at the end, talk about different things like, um, how do you think the ugly duckling felt when he was rejected? Do you think it's okay to treat someone differently because of how they look? So there's a bunch of different questions you can ask your child to really dig deeper into the emotions of the characters um, and the actions of the characters. We also went through and found a few more social emotional learning read readers theaters. Um, that you might want to print out and read and you know ask questions about so these again will be um, the link will be provided at the end and then SEL and writing so different writing topics such as my favorite coping skill tell about a time you were trustworthy and then you can replace the word trustworthy with other character words that we discussed earlier that's like two weeks full of um, of writing prompts Another question is, which of the following practices works best for you, yoga, mindfulness, or meditation, and why? So this is really great, too, for the parent to know, you know, your child might not tell you, I really enjoy yoga, or I really enjoy meditating. So this is a good way for you to also learn a little bit about what they're enjoying so that you can do it more with them. Um, how can positive thinking improve your mindset? What do you notice when you look at someone that is mad? 
And again, replace mad with all the other emotions, there's another two weeks of writing prompts. Um, and writing about stories. So what did you notice about the characters in the story? Were they being trustworthy? And finally, we're gonna talk about bringing social emotional learning into your math lessons. So there's a few ways you can do this. The first one being to create your own word problems. So here's an example of a word problem that, um, that connects to SEL in some way. Lily offers to help the entire class of 24 students with their math assignment. Three students decline the offer. How many students does she help? And then you can talk a little bit more about this as if it were a real thing happening in the class. Okay, and then you can also analyze word problems by you know, solving them first and then discussing um, the people in the story and what they're doing or in the word problem, what they, what they did. For example, Ned has 190 bananas. Sheila steals 133 of them. How many bananas does, does Ned have left? So you can analyze the word problem, talk through it. Um, and finally, breathing strategies. So if your child's a little younger and they're not able to do word problems yet, you can have them do breathing strategies with you and they can count for you, um, count like seconds of how long you breathe in and breathe out, and then you do it for them. So they're getting some counting practice as they're practicing the breathing. And for math, this one to me connects the most with um, SEL. This is using growth mindset in math. Okay, so you probably have heard your child at some point say things like, I'm not good at this. Um, I'm never going to be good at math or, you know, a lot of kids struggle with math. So teaching them to have a growth mindset by saying things like, I can learn anything I want to. When I'm frustrated, I persevere. Um, we'll help them to have grit and success um, as they move forward. So even if they don't feel it, getting them to say these things will help them start to believe it. So I have some examples of what growth mindset statements um, about math may look like. Here we have, I am a great mathematician. With practice, I will get better at my math facts. I will learn how to divide if I keep trying, and so on. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining me. Um, I just wanna recap really quick. Um, social emotional learning is so important. Your children should be doing it at school, at home, at all times, you know, as much as they can. There are so many reasons to do it, not just test scores, um, but also, you know, improve behaviors. They'll be more um, likely to self-regulate and just be a better person overall. So thank you again for having me. Um, I just want to tell you that we have the links here for our Excelligence companies, Discount School Supply, really good stuff, and Steve Spangler Science, as well as a discount code down at the bottom. Um, you will get 20% off your entire purchase through May 20th. With that code, UC Irvine. And we also have our parent resources. So I mentioned throughout the presentation that I have free resources for you, like the Reader's Theater and those different um, worksheets. So if you click the link um, under free resources, you'll be able to find them. If you have any issues, feel free to email me and I can help you find the resource you're looking for. We also have links to the blogs that um, are written by teachers. So our product development team and some other teachers um, and influencers. And finally, we have my email if you want to contact me for, with any questions and my LinkedIn if you'd like to connect with me there. All right, so thank you so much, Nicole. We're going to spend the rest of the time taking a few questions from attendees. So if you have a question, please go ahead and submit it into the chat panel or the Q&A panel um, and then address it to, to us. Um, uh, so if you look at the top or the bottom of your screen, you'll see a menu bar. Click on the chat bubble or the Q&A icon and then type in your question. Um, so Nicole, we did have a question come in. Any recommendations for only children that during this time have only um, virtual interaction with any peers? So um, they said most of the sensory needs are not an issue during the time when children are not in a large classroom dealing with emotional situations. But what are your thoughts on that? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. Um, do you have any recommendations for only children that during this time have only virtual interaction with peers? Okay, so my, so I think character is really important. Um, so you can do different things like, you know, teach them about those different words, like how to be, you know, kind and how to um, do good for others. And at that time, at this time, you can have them do different activities where they're going to then give them to other people. So they know they're still having a relationship with someone. So even if they're writing letters to other students, um, other classmates, or video chatting them with a nice message, um, I think there's a lot of ways that you can keep them still in contact with other students, even if they're not in person. Um, so yeah, I would say definitely video chatting 
a lot and talking um talking to their friends and you know maybe they can even discuss their SEL practices with their with the other students um, would be a way that I would say you could keep them um, together and in conversations. Thank you. Um, another question. Do you have specific resources for toddlers that can be used at home and at school? Yes, actually, if you check out our really good stuff website, we have a ton of um, different things that can be used for younger students as well as um, elementary students, as well as the discount school supply. Um, you can find a lot of sen sensory products, um, different um, types of learning tools, um, crafts and things like that. So check out our websites and um, you'll definitely be able to find some um, social emotional related um, products. We actually have um, some emotions products as well that are really great for younger students or younger children. Thank you so much. Um, how can, can, do you have any resources for um, preteens to encourage reading and writing more? To encourage, um, let me think here. So is that in about SEL, like reading and writing with SEL or just in general? Maybe both. No. Okay, um, so we have a lot of different products that you they can use, um, like writing prompts and things like that, that range from um, elementary to middle school and can be pushed a little bit further if you have, you know, older kids that are, are interested in doing them. Um, but I would say a lot of the SEL prompts and SEL products we have really do range um, in age. So if that person is, you know, can send me an email, I can send them some product ideas for, um, for their student, for their child. Thank you. Um, another question, how can these practices be adapted for blind or disabled children? Um, so a lot of these practices are um, through movement. So you might just have to, for example, if you're doing yoga with them, you might just have to, um, to help them find the pose. And um, sorry, did you say blind and deaf? D or disabled or disabled. Yeah, so I think a lot of it is just helping them feel what they're supposed to feel, you know, um, showing them their yoga poses, having them use sensory bins, things like that. Um, even, um, even doing mindfulness um, for, you know, children that are disabled, they could do their mindfulness activities, things like that. Um, it really depends on the, on the child um, with what you do with them. So it's kind of hard to say without knowing the, you know, the exact. Mm -hmm. I have another question for you. Um, do you have any advice on how to start a young child into meditation since they can be a little fidgety? Um, sure. So definitely start with a, a very short meditation and something that they're able to um, understand. I think when they're younger though, they're not going to be able to fully um, jump into meditation. But you can do different things like um, have them do yoga poses and have them look at pictures and have them, you know, explain what they see in the picture and, you know, how it makes them feel and kind of talk through it. But when they're that young, it is hard for them to kind of get to that level. Um, so I would say my best advice would be for the parent to model what they want them to do. And then as they get a little older, they'll be more familiar with it and ready to take it on um, themselves. Great. And um, what age do you recommend starting to teach SEL? Um, I would say as young as possible. So um, even, you know, when you have your young kids beginning to use the language, so even just using the character education um, language will help them reading a lot of stories. So I think when they're, you know, two or three, reading them these stories about, you know, characters that do good in the world is a good way just for them to understand um, you know, the goals that you'll have that for them as they get older. And what uh, SEL practice would you recommend for a child that gets upset easily? Um, for a child that gets upset easily, I would say to start with something simple like a breathing strategy. Um, you could have them try out the different breathing strategies I showed you before and um, you also might want to set up a calm down corner because then that child's able to go into that calm down corner and figure out um, the best practice for them. So if it's journaling, then they can journal. If they want to color, they can color. If they want to use their fidgets, um, they can use their fidgets. So giving them a lot of options um, is a really great thing to do. And also having, you know, a place for them to kind of 
find their peace and find their place and um, get away from whatever's upsetting them. And last one that I see, how do you make a calming jar? Okay, so there's actually a, a bunch of different ways you can make a calming jar. We have them at Really Good Stuff um, and they have a bunch of different things that um, like orbs and things like that. But if you're making them at home, you could do something as simple as adding water to a jar, um, putting some beads, glitter, uh, glitter glue, maybe some oil, pretty much anything you find in your home um, that's not going to get affected by the water you can put into the jar. Um, I would recommend that you seal the lid because you have some kids that might want to try to open the jar, of course. Um, so seal the lid, close it with super glue, and like I said, you can inc include pretty much anything, um, little plastic beads or you know glitter and things like that into the jar, and they just swirl it around, and there's their calming, um, their calming jar. Okay, that looks like the last question. We will stay on just for a couple more minutes. Uh, feel free to add any questions into the chat or to the Q&A um, button. But um, if not, you are, can be free to go, to go. I hope you enjoyed this webinar. I hope you learned some new tips to help you on your um, SEL and uh, homeschooling journey. Um, please join us next week on May 14th for teacher tricks to use at home. If you have any questions regarding our programs or resources, or if there's any other topics that you would like to see covered in a future webinar, please feel free to send me an email. Um, my email is lindsay.doherty at uci.edu. Thank you so much, Nicole. Have a Thank wonderful you. day, everybody.